Hello, it's early March and it's time for a homestead tour. At the start of March uh, I shut the ducks out of the vegetable garden um, although the little ducks keep finding a way of getting out into well not into this space but certainly into the food forest over there. It is rush hour uh, so while everybody out there is being very busy and going off to work uh, I'm appreciating that my work uh, is here and I don't have to jump in a car and go off and do business. Uh, so this is uh, the asparagus bed uh, which is supposed to be clear of weeds. It's not. It's full of weeds. Um, I will get to them uh, at some point. The asparagus isn't growing yet. Um, it's still it's still very early to think we might get asparagus. Uh, and then over on this side there's some more asparagus uh, and some Taunton Dean kale. Now I did take some cuttings and uh, put them in water and unfortunately uh, I didn't look after them uh, and they, they went um, mouldy. So I will take some more cuttings of this. It will root really easily even in cool temperatures. Uh, so I will do that perhaps today. Uh, we've got the strawberry bed here. In the next couple of weeks I need to go through, clear all the runners uh, that are on top of the bed, uh, all the dead foliage away, uh, ready for uh, the new growth starting this year. And on this side uh, we've got our autumn fruiting raspberries. Now this bed does look really weedy. I don't quite know what to do about it. It's really hard to put cardboard uh, and compost on uh, uh, between the raspberry canes coming up but I suppose I could do it between the, uh, the clumps of plants uh, and I can also see there are some onions. Now I grew onions in this bed three years ago um, and then after that put the raspberry canes in um, but I obviously left some onions in there because uh, they're coming up nicely again. There's quite a lot of them and I'm going to leave them because I can just cut the leaves and use the green leaves. This bed has got the last of the carrots in it from last year. They're not doing too badly at all. So these are the ones that were uh, tiny weeny at the end of the year. Uh, everything is frozen because we had a really heavy frost. But um, these are now about finger sized carrots and they're doing OK. So they're just beginning to grow little uh, white roots again. So shows that they are starting to grow uh, again. So I need to probably harvest some of these. Now, although they were tiny, they were packed with flavour. Oh, Mr. J and I have really been enjoying these. So uh, I look forward <laughs> to harvesting a whole load of these. In this bed, uh, I had parsnips and celery. Well, there's still some parsnips to lift. And <laughs> there's still plenty of celery as well. I really thought I'd used all of it, but very definitely there's celery too. Uh, this bed uh, was covered with that netting last year and had cabbages growing in it uh, and they are here are the very last of them. In fact I could give this to the ducks they'd really appreciate that. Let's give them to the ducks. So this bed's now just covered uh, in duck bedding, um, waiting for me to use it this year. Uh, and this side um, had Greek Gigantes beans growing in it last year. And these are my favourite beans. Uh, they're the very big white ones that are very potatoey in taste, creamy and potatoey. Um, so they are growing, fingers crossed, as perennial plants in here. Uh, we shall see how many come up uh, this year or not. But the plan is uh, that they will be growing uh, in this bed again. Uh, I have got some seeds to sow uh, just in case nothing comes up. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, nature will do her thing uh, and uh, we will have those in here. And the other thing is these, uh, which are garlic. Now these are the garlic that I uh, planted to harvest last summer. I didn't get all of them out. So I've let them grow on uh, as perennials. And when I want to harvest them, I actually just lift the whole clump uh, and then I can use the green leaves 
uh, for a milder garlic taste and indeed the bulbs don't taste they're not as strong as they would be if I'd uh, lifted them and cured them because um, obviously the, uh, the less water evaporated so they've still got lots of water in them, so they're a milder garlic flavour that's still absolutely lovely um, and I, I will let those uh, I will let those grow as they are and just harvest them as I need them throughout the year. And this bed uh, had potatoes and peas in it uh, in 2019. So it had potatoes uh, around the outside and a row of peas in the middle. Um, and what I haven't realised is there were still a few Greek gigantes beans plants in here. So all of these sticks are now marking just about uh, where there is a Greek gigantes bean plant. Uh, it grew again from the year before uh, and so I'm hoping they'll grow again in 2020 because they don't just send up uh, one shoot to climb up. The last year they were sending up three, four, five and I'm hoping this year they'll send up a whole clump and it will be quite a, quite a bushy climbing plant. So again it'll be a mixed bed and I don't really find that a problem. As long as I know uh, where the climbing beans are uh, I can plant everything else uh, around them. On the top here, uh, oh, frozen solid this morning in this morning's frost. Uh, but on the top here uh, is um, composted wood chip. It's still got quite a lot of um, wood in it, but I think it's doing okay actually. And it came from uh, the path here, so I scooped it up from this path and got it onto the bed. It's great because it acts as a, a weed suppressing mulch uh, during the winter uh, and then well certainly in the places I've put it I can see a couple of places where I didn't put any so uh, weeds are growing nicely there but here uh, there are just one or two uh, blades of grass coming through so nice weed suppressing mulch uh, and then obviously it breaks down and adds to the organic matter in the bed and then looking from the opposite direction so that's the bed that had the drug granties beans in it uh, on this side I've covered this over uh, partly because I know I'm going to grow some brassicas in here uh, but also to try and give the chard that's in there a chance. Ducks have been eating it uh, all autumn and early winter, so I'm covered it up to protect it from duck nibbles. Um, it is just starting to grow back, and then hopefully I'll get uh, one or two crops uh, of chard from that before it starts going to seed this year. And just here uh, is my runner bean support system that I've had amazing crops of runner beans since we've moved here I've been really pleased with them but uh, the wind comes in summer somewhere between June and August and I always say the wrong month <laughs> but we get uh, quite heavy strong winds uh, from the south uh, at some point during the summer it's happened each year and what it's done is just knocked the beans down um, flat pretty much um, and then uh, if anything comes from the east it knocks it down flat too so uh, last year Mr J and I constructed this um, bean support so it's uh, six posts into the ground uh, some pieces of pallet wood uh, going along fixed into the posts and uh, and then I have put the canes into the ground and I fixed the canes uh, using cable ties onto, could you string uh, onto here, giving it a fairly solid, fairly rigid support system. And uh, the way I um, put my bean canes up is that rather than being in a triangle and crossing at the top, uh, I have them crossing near the bottom um, so that the beans come up these canes, they climb round and then the beans hang down towards the path which just makes it much much easier uh, for me to pick them now what it isn't easy uh, is to get the ones that are in the middle and I have to do a little bit of, kind of <laughs> climbing through and ferreting around to get those but uh, generally this makes it uh, so much easier you can see I haven't finished clearing off last year's canes well they're not canes are they uh, vines plants uh, yet um, that will come um, and the beans that are in here um, have all been cut uh, so they're about four to six inches of 
of stem still left in the ground. So the roots are there, the stem is there. Uh, hopefully they will grow back up this year. But again, I will sow a few uh, to replace any that haven't made it through the winter. Uh, and this bed has got um, some purple sprouting broccoli in it. Um, it's done really well. Didn't like the first, um, the first harvest we had from it. It tasted almost musty or mouldy, but I'd had this covered over for a very long time and I think it hadn't had enough rain on it so it was there was uh, maybe some fungal uh, action going on uh, anyway once i took it, taken the cover off it uh, and the rain had uh, washed over the plants a few times and um, the the broccoli tastes absolutely wonderful uh, more treats for the ducks uh, this is not uh, like the head big heads of broccoli that you buy in the store uh, that's usually a calabrese um, this one uh, is great, it's really hardy, it will stand through, um, certainly stand through our winters here. Uh, we're in zone 8, 8B, something like that. Um, and it grows uh, one central piece which you snap off and then like almost any other plant it will then send out shoots at the side uh, with more broccoli so you can harvest uh, the florets before the flowers open uh, with a few leaves on it like this it's a really lovely taste if you like uh, the calabrese bro broccoli the big one uh, you're very likely to like this the flower buds uh, are a purpley color uh, but they tend to go green when they're cooked uh, we really like this um, it's a uh, keep on coming back at it almost the more you pick it uh, the more it will send out flowers um, but you do need to keep on top of them because as soon as uh, the flowers open it's basically going to stop producing because uh, messages will go to the plant um, but it is actually sending some flowers and they're going to set seed and so it doesn't need to produce any more. But uh, in terms of uh, amount of yield for the space that they take up, I really rate these uh, for fresh uh, greens during the um, winter and early spring. Uh, and I've also been told that you can actually eat it and once it's gone to flower as well, it just won't keep on producing more and more but you can eat the young flowers uh, too and I know that uh, families will carry on eating this broccoli uh, right through and not waste any of it. This was a mixed bed last year it had um, parsley at this end, beetroots, I can't think what else it's grown in it, it had lots and lots of salady type plants in it uh, I also put uh, some squashes in there. Now the soil in here is uh, oh, <laughs> it's not it's not what you'd call a raised bed so although it's got a frame around it uh, the soil is is pretty much at ground level I really need to work on building the soil in here this year uh, and I will be putting lots of compost uh, and soil improver in here this bed uh, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this bed it doesn't seem to grow very much in it very well um, but it had broad beans in it last year, which didn't do very well. Um, this year, it's got a broad bean growing in it quite happily. So that came up uh, in the late summer, early autumn. It's going through the winter. It's got flowers on it now. Uh, so we might have a few fresh broad beans from that. And then uh, this bed, what did this have in it? I can't really remember. <laughs> I know it had some runner beans in it, um, probably had onions. I think it's, I, it almost doesn't matter what it had in it last year because it didn't have brassicas in it. As long as it didn't have brassicas, I'm not too worried about uh, what I plant in there. I just don't want to put brassicas uh, back in the same bed two years in a row because uh, at the moment we don't have uh, problems with uh, club root or, or anything, uh, any really horrid fungal type of diseases. Uh, so I'm keen not to keep putting them in the same places. And this area, um, I had sweet corn. Well, I did a kind of three sisters uh, arrangement. So there was some sweet corn in it. There were um, dwarf, a yellow dwarf bean in it. Uh, and I also put some squashes in it. Well, the squashes failed miserably. 
Uh, this ground uh, has been untreated, it's unloved. It's pretty much all I did was uh, cover it to um, kill off the grass, but it's had no additions into it. So this year, I also need to uh, work on building the soil here. I have popped a few strawberries in, um, but they are looking very much like the ducks have loved them. Um, so this year, we'll be working on the soil there, working on the soil there. And these are the two beds that have remained empty uh, for more time than any of the others. This bed has got strawberries in it. Um, they've been in there much too long. Uh, I need to lift those uh, and refresh them. I won't plant more strawberries in the same area or move them. Uh, and then that bed can be used for something else. Strawberry plants are better. Uh, they produce their best fruit in years two and three. They will carry on producing, but, but not. Uh, <laughs> they won't be as prolific uh, in their harvest. Um, and given that they produce runners uh, to give you new plants uh, so readily, I might as well just use the runners uh, and replace these old friends here uh, in this bed. So this is uh, Hamburg parsley in here. This is the root parsley. So we ate the um, parsley leaves um, in salads and cooking all summer. And then uh, in early autumn, we started harvesting the roots, which are um, well, I'm not going to be able to get them out of the ground because the ground is, is frozen solid at the moment. But, but uh, they, they look a bit like a parsnip or a carrot. So it's a root veg. Uh, they're a creamy white colour and they taste uh, mildly of parsley. They're really nice. Um, there was some celeriac in here uh, and some dill. And the dill, well, I've always thought of dill as quite a tender herb, but that has got through the winter okay. It's regrowing. Uh, so we've got uh, lots of fresh young dill that we can use uh, in our cooking. And it looks <laughs> very much like there could be one beetroot in there. So there are, there are beetroots that have popped all over the place because um, I wasn't too worried about beetroot because it's such a quick, uh, quick harvest. So uh, I popped some <laughs> rows of beetroot in here, there and everywhere. And this bed um, had uh, our Swede in it, so that's a Swedish turnip or a rutabaga, depending on which country you're in. Um, and my friend Erica uh, over at Erica's Little Welsh Garden was asking um, in my Facebook group uh, yesterday about what were people's favourite um, Swede variety. What I've got to say is not this one. Uh, I really, I've been very disappointed in these. Um, so the variety that I like is one called Best of All. Uh, this isn't Best of All. Um, it, it, this is somewhat mediocre. Obviously not its variety name. Uh, it is. <laughs> I can't remember what the variety it was, but um, whatever it is, I will go back to uh, using varieties that I know because I just haven't been that impressed with it. So uh, this one bed is uh, covered in duck bedding. Um, again, it's suppressing the weeds um, and when it's broken down, uh, it will add to the organic matter in here. Um, yes, while it's breaking down, it will uh, lock up some of the nitrogen uh, that's in the soil, but uh, there is plenty of nitrogen uh, in the duck bedding uh, from the duck poop that's there. So hopefully it won't have too much of an impact um, on the actual soil that things are growing in. And when I plant, I will be moving the duck bedding out of the way and plant into the soil. There's a pallet there that's fallen over. Uh, it was a spare one, it was falling apart. So th there is a lot on our homestead uh, that needs tidying up uh, and repairing. But you know, I'm really not going to beat myself up about not having done it. There is, there is plenty of time. There is no pressure. And one of the things I really don't cope with uh, is when I put myself under undue pressure. So I'm not going to. Um, it will happen when it happens. So this bed uh, last year was my favourite of the raised beds. It had, uh, it had yacon growing in it. Uh, this is the remains of the yacon plants. Um, so it had yacon in it. 
and it had uh, Bellotti beans, I couldn't remember what they were called then. So it had Bellotti beans going along here. Now I thought they might have been dwarf beans, but they weren't, they were climbers. So, <laughs> so I ended up having to put a cane structure in here. I put uh, some uh, courgettes, zucchinis at the end. There were squashes along that side. This bed supported a huge amount of food last year, but I did overplant it. Um, and I think that that then has an impact on the number of fruits we had from the squashes because there were two, three, four, five. I think there were six, uh, six courgette and uh, squash plants in here and everything else and it was just too much. So I will be a bit kinder to this bed this year. And I'm thinking uh, because it's quite deep, um, so it's probably got about four or five inches uh, of compost and soil in it. I'm thinking I might put parsnips uh, and carrots, so lots of root veg in here this year. And this uh, is a globe artichoke plant. And there's actually, <laughs> having a look, there's at least four plants here. So there's the main, uh, main part of it is here. And then there are offsets, uh, one, two, three here. They don't cope with very, very cold temperatures. Um, but this one seems to have done quite well. And I keep saying I'm going to move it and then I don't get around to it. So hopefully this spring, uh, I will get around to lifting some of those offsets uh, and moving them elsewhere. I really like this, not just uh, for the artichokes, but it's got these really architectural leaves. They are big, pale, uh, silvery green leaves. And then these huge <laughs> purple flowers that appear. Um, it's just lovely. Uh, and the bees love them. Uh, you can see here uh, how tall the stems get. This, I think, is a really nice addition uh, over uh, in the patron's garden, uh, in amongst the flower beds. I'm very pleased to say uh, that we have a magnificent display of blossoms from the uh, wild damsons and plums this year. Hopefully uh, this means that we will get a really nice uh, crop from them. Uh, in the last couple of years they've been okay, um, but they've got to this stage and then we've had the really fierce storms and uh, it's just knocked a lot of the blossoms away before they've been uh, pollinated. Today the sun is out so I'm hoping that we will get lots of pollinators out here uh, pollinating these flowers and that the winds stay away long enough um, <laughs> for some of those uh, to actually start forming uh, some fruit. And in this area uh, are some awesome fruiting raspberries. Uh, more raspberries. I, I really do like raspberries and we have got uh, an awful lot of them. So all these canes have been cut right down to the ground, uh, between three and six inches above the ground's left. And they will uh, send up new shoots this year and form fruit uh, on that growth. It's a big old patch <laughs> of raspberries and they have spread uh, quite considerably. So I might need to lift some of these uh, and move them elsewhere. I've been asked uh, about this and what this is. So this is um, this is a chicken run that I made oh, three years ago. Um, and it is exactly the same size uh, as one of our raised beds. So that the idea was I could put it on a raised bed, uh, have the chickens in there for the day uh, or for a couple of days and let them turn over the soil um, and uh, fertilise the soil uh, by, by popping their droppings onto it. Um, but actually, it's a great idea, but the chickens hated being in there. They are so used to free ranging, um, they're not used to being confined uh, in a space this size, that they got really distressed and it doesn't seem like uh, a very kind thing to do to make them uh, stay in it. And then over here, <laughs> down the side of the polytunnel. Um, well, this is a tree that I was going to move. Um, still haven't done that yet. Um, and last year, uh, we created this 
that I call the wide bed uh, because I've got another one along there that I call the long border. So this is the wide border and I grew potatoes uh, in this last year and uh, I keep seeing evidence of them. <laughs> so there are still, uh, still some potatoes in here. I'm going to walk around and collect all these potatoes and replant elsewhere. Uh, they are sending out small roots uh, and shoots so they're ready uh, to get going and I'm go being guided by the potatoes that are out here. It tells me that um, pretty much it's time to start getting my uh, early potatoes out into the ground but I digress. After the potatoes were in here as I lifted them um, I started putting in um, herbaceous plants um, and so I've got some dahlias over there uh, under that straw trying to protect them. I've got some shrubs, I've got some um, herbaceous bulbs, I've got all sorts of things in here actually and I'm hoping this year uh, that this will provide a, a beautiful floral display um, but I am thinking, you know, an art, it's one of those globe artichokes or a couple in here would be really nice. So I've put in lots of things like uh, bronze, fennel, uh, echinacea, dahlias, um, there's verbenas, uh, anemones, lots of lupins. So hopefully it will have a, a nice floral display uh, throughout the year, but I can also uh, put some uh, edibles in here and something like uh, a few potatoes in here I could also get some more rhubarb in here there's plenty of things I can get in uh, or just annual veg that I can get in uh, amongst the flowers and this is the area that I call the patron's garden and I call it that because uh, when I created it uh, I filmed uh, all the stages of making it but the only people who saw those videos uh, at the time uh, were our supporters on Patreon uh, so it became the patron's garden. So the patron's garden is made up of uh, four beds and a central area. Uh, so this bed, uh, or this part of this bed, uh, these are all edibles. Um, well, when I planted it, they were all edibles. I can see things have sneaked in. Uh, so things like the Asturian tree cabbage and chard. Uh, there's some rosemary. Uh, winter savoury, uh, sage, uh, but there are other things like uh, daylilies, uh, which some of which are edible. Um, I've got some white borage over there, flowers can be eaten. Uh, this is a carrot that has gone to seed. Uh, it's, very, it's been lovely actually, it's been great for the birds uh, who've been able to have those seeds been architectural it's very lovely uh, there are some other bits and pieces but I will make a video about some of the more uh, unusual edibles um, which will be with you uh, very soon uh, and then this section has got a couple of rhubarb plants in it well actually that rhubarb plant uh, is going to a new home today uh, because one of my friends um, lifted her rhubarb plant divided it and then it either didn't survive uh, the moving or it may have not survived somebody tidying up in her garden. So I've said she can have that one. Um, so that is a timpeli early or an early timpeli, depending on how you call it, uh, rhubarb. So that's already uh, ready to harvest. Uh, this little one here uh, is a Victoria uh, and is much later. Uh, then I've got some... Um, but I put some annuals in here, so this was a dahlia. Whether that will grow back, I don't know. We haven't had a terribly uh, cold winter. It's been very, very wet and very windy, uh, but our temperatures haven't been really low. So there's a potential uh, that they might have survived. Uh, and then uh, there's my climbing rose. Um, that's Gertrude Jekyll uh, from David Austin Roses. It's very strongly scented, very full, uh, double uh, pink flower. Absolutely love it. Um, so I put that in last year. I'm really pleased to see how much new growth it's got on it uh, already for this year. And I'm hoping it will go up uh, and over that archway uh, to meet the plant on the other side uh, that's coming up from that side. I can see in here uh, we've got little seedlings of things like red orich, 
um, which I absolutely love as plants. They're beautiful. I love the they're very deep, reddy purple leaves. They're very tall, uh, beautiful seed heads on them. Uh, and sadly, I don't actually like the taste of them, um, which, <laughs> which is irritating uh, because they grow so well. But uh, I have to accept that I can't actually like the taste of everything that grows. Um, and these are volunteers. Uh, they will be allowed to grow uh, until I need the space for something else. Um, and then they'll go off to either the chickens or the ducks so it doesn't get wasted. And then the bed uh, on this side of the archway, uh, again, has got uh, very similar uh, to the one over there. So there's some edible plants, some uh, borage. Somewhere in there, I did plant a currant bush, but whether it has been so crowded out by this borage that it hasn't made it through, um, or whether it's just in waiting uh, to spring into life again, we shall see. Um, there's, this isn't a plant, this is pea netting, uh, which I'll use uh, when I get the next sort of peas in. Um, and then this rose here uh, is the one that's gonna go up and over that side. And that uh, is a variety called New Dawn. It's a very pale pink, uh, very delicate colour. I really like it. Uh, so I'm hoping that that will go up uh, over the archway and meet up with uh, Gertrude Deacle on the other side. Uh, this is um, a nine star broccoli, so it's a perennial broccoli. Um, I'm going to pick uh, these bits and have these um, for breakfast. I need two pieces, right, uh, for breakfast. Uh, and then this blue thing here um, is the cover uh, for my fruit frame, which I'm not actually using as a fruit frame. Uh, it's going to be my brassica tunnel for my tall brassicas. So that netting will go over this uh, very soon uh, and I'll get this planted up. So in this bed currently, um, there are some, there's some chard, there's the strawberries, which I keep saying uh, I'm going to lift and I, I haven't yet. I'm going to get those into this bed. Um, so that will have brassicas in it. Uh, this had brassicas in it this year. So this had Brussels sprouts, which I'm still harvesting. Uh, so plenty of Brussels sprouts still to come. They're getting a really good size now. Mr. J's not a fan uh, of Brussels sprouts. Um, <laughs> so I get to have these all to myself. Uh, but this year uh, I will grow probably salad crops in this bed. Uh, it desperately, desperately and definitely uh, needs some attention. And, and then in this section over here, uh, I put in um, onions and shallots, uh, garlic and elephant garlic. Uh, so there's, there's about six rows uh, going across there. But I stopped it about here uh, because I was still trying to uh, kill off the weeds at that area. So I'm going to put some... Um, some more onion sets in, the ones, the spring ones that I can get in now. Well, not, yeah, get them in. I just, I really need to get them in uh, into this, this area here. And then all of that uh, is a new section of uh, market garden, uh, which will have salads and it will have beans. And uh, well, actually it will just have a load of stuff in it over there and at the far end there. Uh, up on the mound uh, is the plum tree, the new plum tree that I planted last week. And this tree um, is a quince. Uh, so it looks uh, almost like a pear, like a, a shortened pear, uh, but it's got a perfumey taste almost. It's, it's very sweet, uh, almost like baby powder smells. Uh, that's the, <laughs> like talcum powder smells. Um, I don't, I don't love them just on their own. You have to cook them uh, to eat them. But I'm thinking that some quince wine might be really nice. Looks like there's lots of new growth on it. Uh, I'm really pleased. And this is uh, the long border uh, in the patron's garden. So this is 17 and a half feet long and four feet wide. And I created this uh, last year. I planted about 200 or more uh, daffodil bulbs in here. Well, I'm not seeing that many come up 
Uh, there are quite a few, um, but not... I was wanting this to be absolutely chock-a-block uh, with daffodils, um, but we'll see. I mean, you know, I can see there are some clumps coming. They're obviously quite late flowering ones because the daffodils round by the uh, chickens are already in flower. So this bed is, uh, it's mostly herbaceous uh, flowers. So there are things like uh, the penstemon, uh, which have just stayed in growth uh, all year. The borage has stayed there, um, but then lots of things have died down underground and are just starting to come back up. So we've got a clump of irises here. Um, as I said, the penstemons. Uh, there's some foliage plants. Delphinium, uh, which I just love. Um, this one uh, is called uh, Noshia or Nautia. I think it's Noshia, uh, but it's K-N-A-U-T-I-A, -A, uh, Noshia. It's very lovely. I've got two of them. I've got one that's a very, very pale pink and one that is the deepest burgundy purple. It's just lovely. Uh, there's some peonies in here, uh, plenty of uh, hardy geraniums. So that's not uh, the, the pelagonium geranium that you see that's got, quite often got very bright red flowers and is used uh, in Mediterranean a lot. Uh, these are hardy geraniums, so true geraniums. Um, great spreading plants, really good for smothering out weeds um, and produce some very, very pretty flowers. Uh, so the borage is there. There's a Dicentra spectabilis at the front. Um, and some lavender. Now this is a white lavender, which I love. Uh, what have we got here? Some Achillea. And that was given to me uh, by Erica for my birthday last year. There's some phlox, uh, some Japanese anemones. Uh, there was supposed to be um, a hellebore in here, but uh, that hasn't come back up. Um, there's plenty of um, monarda, daylilies. <laughs> Uh, what else have we got down there? An apicia, uh, more peonies. Uh, there's a teasel. Um, <laughs> so there's a whole uh, mixture of plants and there's lots more in here uh, that I can't actually remember what it is and it's still underground. So as that appears during the spring and summer, I can uh, be all excited and pleased to see those plants reappear. And then this bed uh, was the last one that I made. I was going to do this like a hool culture bed, so it would have been mounded up. Um, and I put a whole load of um, broken pallets on the ground and filled it with compost. And um, these are heat treated pallets, so they're not, um, they haven't got toxic chemicals on them. And these will break down eventually, uh, but it was a good way to get rid of uh, the broken ones. Um, but also allowed me to uh, have some sort of framework here to plant things in. So I've got things like Verbena uh, boreensis here. I can see daffodils coming up. Uh, we've got the silver birch tree just on the outside of it uh, and uh, a little tiny rose to climb up through the branches of that. There's a cotinus, uh, a smoke bush over there with its purpley leaves and pink uh, frothy flowers. And then around the edges, uh, there are things like uh, chives and plenty of uh, salsify, which has um, kept going since last year, but also self-sown everywhere. Uh, these are Sweet Rocket. Uh, this is a white one and uh, it will grow to, to about this high or slightly higher uh, with white panicles of flowers, which are lovely. And uh, it was this bed uh, that I had, and here's the remains of it. Uh, this bed I had my sacrifice cabbages in. Um, so I, these are cabbages that I put specifically uh, for butterflies and moths to lay their eggs on. Because um, obviously when I've got them, all the brassicas covered in netting, it means I'm not actually supporting that butterfly population. And without those butterflies, there'll be a whole load of birds that aren't eating. So, that's my uh, that's my input to supporting that butterfly population uh, without actually giving them all the food uh, that we want to eat. 
there's an angelica there uh, they are superb again big tall structural plants uh, with huge flower heads on them that's going to have a kind of globe and then it'll open up into sort of fairly flat flowers but lots and lots of tiny weeny flowers rather than one big one um, and across the front here which look like they have all but disappeared um, <laughs> are lots of things like uh, coreopsis uh, so lots and lots of uh, floral plants and we'll see how many of those come back up uh, over the spring and early summer and this bed uh, is the first one that I put in uh, into this area um, it's got some St John's wort in it some lemon balm uh, this is an apple tree it's got some comfrey here lots of wild strawberries and primroses there's a peony there <laughs> There is salsify, uh, self-sown everywhere across here. Uh, there's a salvia, and that's salvia hot lips, which is a little uh, red and white flower. Um, and then rosemary chives. And um, here is a euonymus, um, which is just growing from a cutting. I'm not entirely happy with this bed. It's got covered with a uh, creeping buttercup, which I will need to literally use a hand trowel or fork to dig out and if I leave any bits of roots in there it, it will just romp away again uh, but I will do that um, I can see it's all starting to grow <laughs> in amongst the lemon balm uh, which means it'll be really difficult to get out so the sooner I do that the better oh this is a beautiful cherry tree I love the shape of this it's almost uh, a complete globe it's lovely and back here is, well, this is my disaster zone. So this is the result of not really understanding um, how much things were going to grow. And, well, it's the result of not planning enough. Um, so I created these long, thin beds. There's one there and one on this side. Uh, and I put raspberries in them uh, and a uh, Lysisteria formosa. There's a white currant here, and somewhere down there, uh, there is a sage plant. Well, I didn't really take on board just how much uh, these raspberries spread, um, partly because of their height, and these are waiting to be cut right down to the ground, but um, I didn't really. Um, take on board how tall they would get how much they would flop over uh, and how much they would spread uh, so quickly so uh, poor planning um, has been a shame really because it's meant this area has got really neglected because it's just been so difficult to work in so I put in a, a pond here so this is actually a raised pond I did it by putting um, logs down on the floor and then I found a piece of lining material uh, when we were first moved in which we put in here <laughs> put it in and put some water in it to see if it leaked uh, well that was uh, almost four years ago now um, and it's still here and it doesn't leak um, but I tried to not let the ducks in this anymore um, because I want it to be for wildlife uh, unfortunately the little ducks uh, think otherwise they've worked out they can escape the duck enclosure uh, so another job for this weekend is to make that more secure uh, but then I want to come through and cut these raspberries back lift the really big brambles uh, take cuttings um, of things like taberries and loganberries that have grown from the fence uh, to almost where my feet are and just have a really good tidy up of this area so I can make some sort of assessment uh, of what I want to do with it next. This is a peach tree. Um, <laughs> ducks have got a lot to say for themselves right at the moment. Uh, so the blossoms are just coming out on the peach tree. I'm really hoping that neither the frost nor the wind damage these. We actually didn't get any peaches last year. Uh, but there's plenty of blossoms here which makes me hopeful 
uh, makes me really hopeful for fruit this year. And then back round uh, pretty much to where we started, um, this is the first area of the food forest that um, I started planting up. So I have a small herbaceous border here. I feel it's really important uh, for me to have uh, flowers in the garden. Uh, I, don't, I don't want the, the place just to look uh, utilitarian and functional. And I, I know that a, a large swathe of it is, but I also like having the colour and the frivolity uh, of having uh, flowering plants in here. They attract pollinators, they attract me, uh, and they also give me some cutting flowers to take into the house. So this area is, um, well, that was a tractor tyre that had mint growing in it. I don't know if any of that mint will come back this year. What it has got is a really, really healthy cooch grass plant in it. So I think what I might need to do is just actually cover that completely for uh, a year. Um, I'm having a look to see if there's something else growing in there. That could be... Well, okay, so there might be another plant in there as well. Something like a Forsythia or something growing in there, or a bit of Jasmine. I'll get that out. I'm going to cover this completely to kill off that cooch grass. Uh, I have got some mint because uh, it grew out the side of there uh, and it's in the pathway here. Um, so the mint isn't killed off, but I will uh, get that tidied up. There's another tractor tyre there with a buddleia in it, which I just popped in um, to, <laughs> to see it through the winter as I'd lifted it from somewhere else. Well, that's kind of exploded in, in its growth. Uh, it's grown to about, I'm going to guess, I, you know, uh, maybe nine or ten feet high uh, and certainly ten feet across. Uh, that's waiting to be cut back really hard. Um, it's starting into new growth now, so I do need to get that done soon. There's a lot of jobs I need to get done soon, uh, and they will all happen, uh, or not. <laughs> I'm hoping they do. Uh, so this is um, a blackcurrant bush. This is a variety called Big Ben. It has really big uh, blackcurrants on it. Really nice tasting. I do like this. Uh, I've taken plenty of cuttings of this um, to propagate more of these uh, for home use. Uh, this apple tree, well, I probably need to prune it. I probably need to take out uh, this branch and take it back. Um, as with all our fruit trees, when I planted it, I had it leaning uh, that way into the wind and it was staked, um, but the wind has already uh, pushed it over in this direction. There's not much I can do about that, uh, but I could probably take this branch out make it less uh, lopsided it is actually crossing over uh, with this branch and I'm not sure which one should come out whether it would be this or this uh, I will take some advice uh, before I do that but anyway it does need a bit of reshaping uh, and then over here uh, there's blueberry uh, and a couple of red currants uh, they they haven't done brilliantly this year Oh, I'm looking at that. Maybe that was a black currant as well. This one's definitely a red currant. Um, and here uh, is a Lysisteria formosa, uh, a pheasant berry. I absolutely love these plants. And this has grown uh, in three years from, uh, well, from a seed. Um, they're absolutely splendid. Uh, they have got edible berries. Uh, I'm not hugely keen uh, on them, but again, uh, they can go into wine. Uh, but I do like these uh, for their shape, uh, their structure. They are great at forming a windbreak, uh, and the pollinators, particularly the bees, uh, really seem to enjoy them. And then over here uh, is um, another rhubarb, um, simply early. This one I just tipped, a complete wheelbarrow uh, worth of duck bedding on it uh, in the late uh, late autumn and it is absolutely <laughs> loving it. Uh, this plant's probably ready uh, to be lifted and divided. It's a bit late to do that now um, but certainly in the autumn uh, when this starts dying back we'll divide this up. And uh, This is the shrubbery which needs a lot of TLC 
as uh, as does well most of our garden at this time of year. Um, there's a lot of cooch grass uh, growing at ground level. Um, but what I have got here um, is a bay tree. Um, so this is a, a bay for cooking with. Oh, I love the smell of this. Uh, I also use the leaves uh, a lot um, in flower arranging. Oh, and it just smells wonderful. So I'm going to carry on mm, enjoying this bay tree. And so wherever you are in the world and whatever you've got planned for today, I hope it's a good one. And I also hope you'll join me again next time.